Um, <clears throat> message title this morning is The Foundation of Our Faith. I'm going to start with this particular question. Um, <clears throat> what does it mean to be double-minded? The Bible speaks a little bit about being double-minded. Pretty much we kind of both, we, we kind of have a, an idea. It doesn't mean that you're blessed with two, two brains. Kind of know it doesn't mean that, right? That's, <laughs> I don't know if that would be a blessing or not. It would be confusion probably. <clears throat> so it says in James 1, and um, much of this you'll be familiar with, I'm sure, at least the scripture part of it. James 1, 5 and following. But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to us generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to, or that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded person, unstable in all his ways. So we need to ask the question of ourselves, uh, if we consider this to be a condition, not a disease, just a condition, do any of us suffer from being double-minded? I think all of us at times find that we're kind of not sure about some things and um, double-minded. But we see, we see from the Word of God that being double-minded absolutely screeches to a halt the things that we formerly perhaps were believing for. To give you an example of this to some degree, <clears throat> this is um, at Mount, Mount Carmel, where the prophets of uh, Baal and, and Elijah were up there, if you remember this. And so he says to the people of God, <clears throat> Elijah came, this is 1 Kings 18 and 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate, or halt, maybe I'll say in the King James, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? Isn't that an elegant way to say that? How long are you going to be stuck, right, between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, and if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. I tell you, they were <laughs> uncertain, were they not? They didn't know whether they could fully trust God or whether it was Baal. They, they were in between. Have you ever been in between? Okay, these, you know, you're not giving anything up, you're not... Saying you're a bad person if you answer that. <clears throat> so how does it come about? How does double-mindedness come about? So would you say that the modern church, uh, that this is a problem in the modern church? That, that, that faith is a, a kind of a, um, uh, a realm that is in somehow by worldly standards to be... Uh, to be questioned. Faith, faith is something that, that uh, is not reputable. Faith is something that, that uh, by the modern mind, by the world, faith is something that for uneducated people who don't know any better, things of faith are kind of like that. The modern church is plagued with this problem in between. And so the question becomes, how much is it a deal with us individually, how much might we struggle with the question of being double-minded? In fact, I would say before God, it is one of the most critical things you'll ever consider in your walk with God. What measure am I double-minded? How? In what way am I afflicted by this? In what way does it get in the way? So the mixture of faith and doubt, the mixture of faith and doubt, result in double-mindedness. <laughs> so... Um, you know, the, the man said, um, I do believe, help my unbelief, right? So he had belief and unbelief all at the same time. What do you count that? Being double-minded. So we kind of think we have faith, we're all in. But God says, no, you can have faith and have unbelief all at the same time. What we do is we're in this kind of in-between place often. where we're not really um, certain. So the mixture in faith results in double-mindedness. Modern minds might say something like this. How could there be a hell? Isn't God a good God? People in the church will say that too. They will. But, but the, the Bible says there is a hell. So therefore, they are in doubt that there's a hell. Therefore, by scriptural standards, they are 
either in doubt or double-minded, right? Um, it just doesn't sound reasonable. The whole question is, I have a definition of God that is a good God by my definition, therefore, if what you say does not comport with what my definition of good is, then it's not reasonable. Is that not the modern mind? The modern mind is aloof to some degrees, uh, lifting itself above the knowledge of God in many ways. Now, I'm not saying it's you or anyone here, but I'm not saying it's not. Only God can deal with you to whatever measure this message is for you, right? So one might say, I hear one thing, i.e. miracles are both real and an integral part of the church. Then I hear that miracles are simply a myth used to persuade gullible and non-educated people. Don't you think there's a big swath of opinion out there that says miracles are just nonsense? There are foolish, gullible people believing in myths. Have you not heard this? Well, they might allow that they don't happen anymore, but really underneath it, you know, miracles conflict with their worldview, which is to say there isn't a God, and what we see now is simply come about by natural processes. So therefore, miracles couldn't happen because they won't align themselves with natural processes. So, but you're right. Even if they do say, well, yeah, back then, but no longer. Somehow, maybe, if there is a God, that's the other part, John. Somehow, if there is a God, somehow he works some miracles back yonder, but not now. And, you know, how much sense does that make? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a God who's not the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? That's a God who differs. So, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So, now, all right, so we're, we see this sort of moving in, 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 into it. So um, you would say that miracle, you know, miracles are simply a myth used to persuade gullible, non-educated people. And some people might say, well, gosh, it's just hard to know. It's hard to know, particularly people who are just beginning to look at faith, people who are just beginning to hear about God, people just, and they hear the world's report. And you hear that everything is natural. Everything has come about naturally. There isn't any creative imprint about what we see around us. Everything has come about naturally. And people struggle, and they might want to believe, but then the world says another thing. So they would say it's hard to know for sure. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, <laughs> and I, I already, not, not um, saying this the wrong way, but I all know that you're gracious to me, and so you let me build it a little bit before it kind of, um, takes a sharper focus. So, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about knowledge for a second. I want to talk about knowledge having to do with people in the church. This is 1 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2. The Bible says this. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, this was a big dispute here with the Corinthian church. And really, this is what it's about. There are some people who know that God is real. There's only one true living God. And they know that God is neither impressed or unimpressed if you eat or don't eat anything that was sacrificed to an idol. And if you were a person of faith, you'd realize there is no such thing as an idol. They're just made up things. There's only one true God. So food is just food. It doesn't make any difference. So they would have the knowledge to say, I have freedom to eat the stuff. It doesn't make any difference. It's just food. There's nothing to do with it. You know, there's no such thing as an idol. That's just a made up fiction. So I'm good, right? So they had a sense of knowledge. They understood something. Now, the reason this is important for us, these were church people, okay? And they had this knowledge. However, what the Bible teaches is that other people who might be weak in their faith they would not have the same knowledge and paid attention to the whole idea of idols and so forth and saw you eating this food that was allegedly um, sacrificed to idols, then that could be very, very, very damaging to their faith, right? So it says as follows. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. This is to say that we all have some understanding about these things. We all know that there's one God and that kind of thing, meaning the believers, people who might be mature, you might say. We know that we all have knowledge, so we all have an understanding, we all know about this. Then it says, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So we have this question in the church, that people in the church were, because of knowledge, uh, they, were, they became aloof or almost arrogant because they had a, an insight an understanding, and what that did is it allowed them to do whatever they wanted without regard to how it was going to affect anyone else. So the statement is made that knowledge in and of itself without the heart of God will, will puff you up 
and elevate you and made you arrogant. We follow so far? Are we all okay with that? Now, that's for people inside the church. How about people who are not inside the church? I wonder what knowledge does to those folks. We still okay? It says, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything he has not yet known as he ought to know, the knowledge that you think you have, if it's outside of the direction of the love of God in your heart, if it's moving in some direction not governed by this, you don't really know anything yet. That's what it's saying. You think you know, but you're puffed up. Yet knowledge is a good thing, given that it is right-directed, right-motivated. We okay? So it's a resource. It's not any different than money. It depends on how the motive for using it. Now, um, again, about the people in the church. Love being the motive here. Just to sit in contrast with what we already read from Matthew 5. Again, this is still building it. Matthew 5 and 22 says this, but I say to you that Everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you are, you're a good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into a fiery hell. God is saying that your motive is everything. Your motive is everything. You can't run your mouth. You, you, you think, well, I can judge, or I, that, that's a stupid idiot over there, or whatever the case is. If you say it in Irish, it would be Egypt. But anyway, it's the same, uh, it's the same word, <laughs> idiot. So uh, uh, you can't say that. Why? Because it's coming out of a wrong, damaging, hurtful place where you're bringing destruction. You can't say that because God will hold you um, yeah, accountable, but he's saying this, the uh, offense is severe enough, guilty enough to go into a fiery hell. So... The whole question of motive is so vital in all these things. It's vital where we're coming from. So whether we understand knowledge can be used with wrong motive or we can think we can judge people or say things over people. And God says, no, you can't because you're going to be in a lot of trouble. <clears throat> now, it says this. It says this in Daniel. Some of you are aware of this, a prophetic uh, pronouncement from Daniel 12 and 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. That's what it says. So looking forward from Daniel's time to now, what the prophetic voice was saying is that what will happen is there will be more and more and more and more and more knowledge. Remember, we're talking about the foundation of our faith. So uh, I just wrote this to say this out. The place of knowledge, and most especially scientific knowledge, has so vastly increased in these past two centuries. Genu generally speaking, people today, just average folk, defer to science and see reliance on God as a vestigial or a vestige in the same way that human appendix is a remnant of something no longer necessary for the proper functioning of the body. You know what I mean by that. There's no need for your appendix, as far as science understands. So it's a vestige. So modern people see people of faith, often the faith just being a vestige that's no longer necessary for society. You might not think secular people think like this. Just watch the news. Just watch the political arena. How many people are saying they're dependent on God in terms of your candidates? I can't identify anybody. Secular people are pushing God to the, don't want God. It's past tense, no longer necessary. It's a vestige from another time when people were needy. People had to have a crutch. People had to have, they didn't have enough enlightenment. They weren't progressive enough. They didn't really understand how life works. They didn't understand the power of government. They didn't understand. See, it's the same old story, old story, old story, old story from the beginning of time until now. Now it's manifesting again that we can do it on our own. Am I wrong? So, um, generally speaking, people today defer to science and see reliance on God as a vestigial feature, um, an old-fashioned part of what now is an enlightened, progressive, free, and evolving people. 
people no longer wish to be restrained by all the seemingly unreasonable, restrictive, prejudicial, moral standards embodied in the Christian faith. They want to cast off. Is that not what the Bible says that's going to happen? They're going to cast off all restraint, the Bible says. Are you not living through this? Are you asleep? <laughs> knowledge will increase. So all the scientific knowledge heaped up, giving place to everything around you, giving a reason, an understanding, a format, a warrant, a foundation of explanation for everything you see can be explained without God. That's secular humanism. Therefore, God is unnecessary. If you hold on to God, you're a fool, and you're hindering, you're hindering the rest of us. <laughs> okay? We're all together. Good, 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 good. So what's a believer to do? <laughs> right? Um, how does this really impact you and me? How does the church go forward in such an environment? When if we're honest and don't, don't have you know, blinders on and, and come into our little corral and pretend all is rosy. If we do that, then we're bigger fools. And, but if we face what's really happening among us and around us, what do we do? So this is from Isaiah 32. It says as follows. For a fool speaks nonsense. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Isn't that a great statement? For a fool speaks nonsense. Fool makes no sense. This is the important part. And his heart inclines toward wickedness. His heart inclines away from righteousness, away from holiness. To practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord. Are we seeing any of that today? To keep the hungry person unsatisfied and so forth. Then, then, then it says this. The Psalm um, 50. Three, and I think this is pretty topical for our times right now. Psalm 53 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Really, the definition of foolishness is nonsense. It's make no sense. Of course there's a God. But the fool says there is no God. He said, They are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice, and there is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there's any who understand, who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, I'm not saying we're in as bad a state as this, but we're not that far away. And that's the direction we're going. And God is looking from heaven. And God poses this question have the workers of wickedness known that open season and mocking uh, Christian values, mocking Christians is open. It is, it is, um, it's, Christians have become the sort of a um, cultural uh, court gestures. They've become fools. Is this news to anybody? Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as though they uh, ate bread? What does that mean? So they're going to come against Christians. They're going to uh, tear them apart, do, you know, do whatever they can to take their stuff and, and uh, not have justice for them and so forth. Um, and have not been called upon, and have not called upon God. They do these things. They don't call upon God. And then it, I don't have to read the other part of it. Then there will be a great fear so he says, God will respond to this eventually. And I will read that. There will be, uh, they, and they were in great fear where no fear had been. For God scattered the bones of him who had encamped against you and put them to shame because God had rejected them. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when God restores his Catholic people. Uh, oh, Jacob, rejoice. Let Israel be glad. So God sees. Could we say amen? So we have to have confidence that God sees everything that's going on. We, we can't lose hope, and we can't get dashed because we think the political process is broken. And I tell you, for many, many Christians I know, they can't separate themselves from the political process to faith in God. They can't. If their person, their woman or man is not do I mean is not the right one, they're just absolutely dashed. 
It's sad if you're a Christian and you're that place. It is very sad. We have a political process. We are obliged to participate in the political process. But if that is our foundation, we are, God is calling us to something higher than the political process. He is. So by what means can we, can a believer go forward in faith? How can we avoid becoming timid? Because that's going to happen to a lot of people. If you start getting mocked, made fun off in the grocery store if you're wearing like a, some kind of little Christian shirt or something. Somebody's, oh, you're one of those guys. You're one of those born-againers. <laughs> I guess none of that's ever happened to you all. <laughs> oh, it happens. <laughs> and more and more and more, it'll happen. You get your feelings hurt like, ooh, get all. I don't believe anyone here is going to have their feelings. So I want to say that over you. I want to claim the good for everybody. So to, how are we going to avoid becoming timid and even possibly ashamed of our faith? Hide it under a bushel. How can we grow stronger in faith? How can we teach or share the gospel of Jesus Christ with any confidence in this pretty hostile environment? How do we do that? Right? The foundation of our faith. Foundation of our faith. I just want to say, this is not the first rodeo for God. <laughs> this is not the first occasion on the earth where the people were not particularly open to the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, when you read the book of Acts, you realize there was a great deal of hostility to the Christian faith, both from pagan people and from Jews. Could we get an amen? amen. And from the Roman government. There was hostility on all sides. So who are we to get all kind of... Lily Levert, let me use Western terms, <laughs> like the bad guys. <laughs> Who are we to be that way? <laughs> I'm deadly serious. Our God is looking to us in this hour. What he has invested in us, what he has given us, what he is calling us to, what he is calling us for, this is the hour. So it's not the first occasion. So let's look at the scripture and how Paul dealt with this very thing, a hostile environment for the Christian faith. So what does he do? So it says this, it's 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 20 through 31. So now he's going to use a sort of rhetorical device. He's just speaking sort of philosophically and using this rhetorical device to get this point out. And so what he says is this, where is the wise man? That is to say, where is the person whose people look to as being smart? The inside, the, the, uh, you know, the clever Dude, the one with the quick answers, the one who has the late night shows. <laughs> you know, who, where's this guy? Um, where is the scribe? That is to say, the, the, um, the writers and the, uh, those per persons who are scholars and, and that kind of thing. And where's the debater of the age? Where are the ones who, who really uh, can craft very cunning, uh, clever arguments? Where are all of these people? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now listen to what the Bible says. Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Made is past tense. This is already done. So God has already made foolish the wisdom of the world. That's a big deal. That's already established. God has already made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, what happened? God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So God has it rigged. It doesn't matter how smart they are, how educated they are, how clever they are, how much data they have, how much knowledge they have, how much stuff they've got going on, how many resources they have, how many collaborators they have. It doesn't make any difference before God. You need to understand this because you will be pulled into being Doubting when they speak. Now, if you watch a Bill Mowers or somebody like that, and I don't watch this guy, but sometimes on YouTube you'll hear him mouthing off and mocking Christians. So I do check some of that stuff out. And you know, they're clever and they're hipster and they use humor and they're slick and hip and all that there. And it appeals to the human side of us, right? And particularly a lot of young people are drawn to this. And do you know that millennials, really very, very few millennials are coming to faith? Oh, really? Why? Because they're buying into all these things. Because they're trained, they're trained to believe in school and so forth, to stand on, to rest on, to trust 
knowledge, particular secular knowledge. It will give an explanation for why things are the way they are outside of God. And that's the report that they trust. You all know this, don't you? But I mean very, very, very few millennials. Something like maybe 10% of millennials. Maybe less. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of God? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God is well pleased, therefore. So God made it where it was impossible for human wisdom to get to know him. That is not how it's going to happen. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a God of grace. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a free gift. Otherwise, God's ways would not be superior. So if all the eggheads in this world could figure out and devise how to get to God, then uh, you know, they would get all the glory. But that's never going to happen. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. <laughs> Did you know that preaching was foolishness? <laughs> it is. This is what the Bible says. It's foolishness to the scientific mind. It's foolishness. It just looks like uh, people needing a crutch, all the things you've ever heard. People needing some kind of other basis to live their life, some, some other foundation because they can't manage on their own. This is what you're going to hear. Have you never heard this stuff? The foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, which all of these are places that we could stop and really preach that out, but we can't do that. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. Just like I'm saying. When we think about Gentiles, uh, Western, it's the Grecian form. I'm going to say formula. That would, that's be it. Never mind. It's kind of funny to me. But it would be the Grecian model. So. And so, uh, meaning, we search for wisdom. That's what we do. Here in the West, we search for wisdom. We search for understanding to possess it. But to those who are called, both Jews, to those who are called... We don't want to get hung up in that either because there's a whole division of how people understand that. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise." Isn't this just so wonderful? Now, the reason that this is important for us to understand, because if all we hear is the world's report, we will doubt our faith. We will question whether or not this is so. Well, maybe the world did, maybe the universe did start, you know, 17 gazillion years ago, whatever the case is, or, or what have you, or what, you know, whatever, or, you know, maybe humankind is 2 billion years old, or, or anything that you're saying, it will, this, you know, it will disrupt your faith. You follow what I'm saying? The Bible is not, and I don't want to wander off here, it's not really intended to be looked at in a scientific way. The Bible says we were created. We didn't just evolve. So that is true. The manner in which, the context in which is true isn't particularly stated other than it describes what God formed from the ground and breathed and we became a living being. It doesn't give you dates. It doesn't give you anything like that. You either believe that or you believe the other way. That some, some kind of cos, you know, cosmic accident, electric spark, hit some sort of chemical soup somewhere, and caused some other thing to happen, and then that bumped into something else. And before you know it, there was this very microscopic chain reaction. And eventually, out of all, you know, 17 gazillion years later, here we are. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, to Gentiles' foolishness. But those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. But those who are called both Jews and Christ, it's what we preach, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the, the weakness of God is stronger than man. For consider your calling, brethren, that there's not many of us. Why is that, that there's not many of us? How, why is it that God has not called many who are, who are um, you know, extraordinarily gifted or, or uh, have extraordinary um, um, positions of power, extraordinary, uh, being extraordinary uh, uh, high in society, and, and um, you know, being able to govern people or govern industry or, or those kind of things. Why has God not done that? 
So given that those people would be prideful, that's, that's true. Um, it is very true. However, as well as that, there could be very clear confusion as to their capability somehow had something to do, their capability had something to do with us being ushered into the presence of God. Their understanding, their insight, their, their ability, their capacity, which we might not truly fully understand, they're the ones, those special ones. And in the early part of the gospel, there was a lot of that. Gnostic gospel, special people with special understanding, deep insight that they were the special ones. God says, no, 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 but you're right. If they're filled with pride and... Anyway, so there weren't too many of those. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that, which are strong. And the base things of the world... And the, despised, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. So how does God go about doing all that? How does God choose little things to bring down big things? How does God, share, how does God go about doing all of that? <laughs> he does it, it says, well, how does he go about doing all that? So by his doing, it says, you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So praise God for that. But but this gives us the ability to go to the next chapter. And then hear how Paul, after giving that uh, insight about God's motives and God's ways, he says this. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. So after speaking here in 1 Corinthians, we see after explaining all of that, he says, and this is why I came this way. I came this way with no superiority of speech or wisdom. And do you think Paul was a pretty bright fellow? You think he was well-educated? You think he was pretty savvy? You think he kind of understood how to govern men and women and make things happen in his natural Giftedness? Absolutely. But did he lean on that? This is where the church has to really make a clear distinction here. Whether we're going to be Greek in our thinking, Greek in our orientation, or whether we're going to be spiritual. And you know what? You may think, well, Pastor, this doesn't, you know, this doesn't affect me really. Okay, I can't say this without either insulting me, you, the church, God, somebody. We don't really know how bad off we are, needing to understand everything, needing to accept that only we can understand it, needing to be able to have a a, a firm opinion and either reject it or not reject it according to our standards that we hold over the gospel. You either overstand the gospel or you understand the gospel. You don't want to overstand the gospel. The gospel's greater than you. So, did not come to you with the spirit of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimonies of God. For I determined to know nothing among you. Okay, let's stop there. All right, I'll give you a minute to drink that in. He made a determination, he purposed, he had it as his strategy. He was going to implement this to know nothing. What on earth? To know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Have you listened to any of the political stuff? Well, we might need to pray for one another if we would listen to that stuff. Um, I know this just from human stuff. Whoever you're going to speak I mean, just if you ever take any kind of speech or anything like that there, here's some of the elements. You've got to know who your audience is. You've got to know the makeup of the audience. What socioeconomical level they're in. Whether it's primarily men or women. What other aspects to them. What um, economic level. What education level. What concerns they're dealing with whether they're mostly married or not married, you should have 
This is what speechwriters will tell you. You should have a good understanding. So why? So you can craft the message according to the context. Now, doesn't that sound wise? It does sound wise. And there's a place for that. <laughs> but Paul says very plainly, we're not doing that going to craft my message according to my interpretation of who you are or what perhaps I might construe as what you're looking to hear or what you think you need. That is not going to happen. It is not going to happen. I am not going to know who started the church. I'm not going to know whose mama runs everything. I'm not going to know who's, you know, the biddies and who the one the troublemakers and who I'm not going to know all the stuff that happens in church. I don't want to know any part of that. You think well he's not very sociable. He doesn't care. Wow. He loves them though. I determined to know nothing among you. What a statement. What a statement. I had as my strategy. I determined to do nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he determined to know. This is what he did determine to know. Jesus Christ and him crucified. He determined to know Jesus. I'm going to say this again and again and again. He determined to know Jesus. He determined to know Jesus. To truly know him, to know all about him, to be yielded to him, to be personal, to be intimate with him, to commune with him, to have everything that was going on in Jesus' heart manifest before him. He determined to be ready, to be filled with the power and the life and the light and the goodness of Christ. He determined to be ready that way and no other way. No wisdom, no knowledge, no understanding, no social background, no, nothing like that. Nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. I think he could have done it the other way. I think he could have crafted a very logical, a very... Uh, uh, Strong message that worked from logic the way lawyers do, that you end up with this conclusion. I think he could have crafted it in such a way to persuade you. Him persuading you. Do you think that happens in the pulpit at all? All the time. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding of who you all are. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a place for that because love demands some of that. But listen to the way, listen to how the, as we go on. Not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Now here we get down to it. We get down to the place where this now becomes foolishness <laughs> to, to, the, to, the, to the Greek, right? But in demonstration, that is to say, Paul had a knowing that if the only thing that he was going to bring was Jesus... His, the fullness of Jesus, the fullness of the Spirit, if that is the only thing, he didn't need anything else. Not only that, everything else would get in the way. Do we look at it this way today? Does the church operate this way today? No. Even in the so-called Pentecostal denominations, from what I gather, there is a sort of a turning back. Things becoming much more social. People not wanting the gifts of the Spirit to break out because it seems chaotic. And what will people who don't understand it come in and what, what might they think? And even the Pentecostal wants to tone it down, dial it down, become more social, become more. I say to you, from the heart of God, he's wanting it exactly the opposite way. He's wanting for our dependence and to have an understanding. His strategy is that it doesn't matter what the knowledge level is. If it's 12 times more than it is now, he can turn all of that to foolishness. And he will turn it all to foolishness, but, but I'm ahead of myself. But in demonstration of spirit uh, and power. Now, 
in another place, it, it, he said that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation, does it not? That's in Romans. So the gospel is the power, but then the demonstration of the Spirit, and the Spirit's leading. And I, I just want to tell you this. If you knew what Aunt Susie's uh, uncle's uh, uh, horrible uh, injured leg problem has been for the last three years, and you already know that going in, the Holy Spirit, in some way, the Holy Spirit is hindered. No, I'm not saying that right. The glory to God gets muddled. But if you know nothing except Jesus Christ, and God is able to speak to you and say, that man's leg is going to be healed, so call him out and speak to him, tell him his leg is being healed right now. You see, if you don't know anything, only, 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 God's going to get the glory there. Only. And we say, that's too primitive. That is too freaky. That makes no sense. It's uncomfortable. It, it's just so... Uh. Why do I say that? Because I have to labor through those feelings myself, at least in time past. Because I'm a pretty logical fella. I want things to make sense. I want order in my mind. I don't want to surrender all of that and let God do whatever he wants. Oh, my goodness, preacher. And there's some of that in all of us. We're not going to get an amen to that? Hang me out to dry. It's okay. I still love you. That your faith would rest, your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, the foundation of our faith, but on the power of God. Let me tell you this. When you lie down on your bed to sleep at night, you're not going to rest if your bed's wobbling all over the place. We don't have a bed, hopefully you don't have a bed like that. If your bed sags down six inches, you're going to roll over so many times, you know, there'll be, I don't know, skid marks on your butt. I mean, <laughs> when it says rest, it, it clearly does mean where it's founded, where it's placed, where it's, where it's um, positionally, where it is, what it's, what's resting on, it means that way. But it also means that it's not going to wander where your faith rests. It's going to be there. It's not going to be moved. It's not going to be disrupted. It's not going to be challenged. It's not going to go anywhere else. If your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but rest where? Your faith needs to rest. Could we say amen, church? It really does. It needs to rest. It needs to be unshakable. We need to know that God has a plan. We need to know that what the world is saying, how the world is mocking and so forth, is not new. And it doesn't make any difference. And for us not to get caught in that. And I know that, you know, that you all kind of know this. Your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Um, and I said earlier about Romans 1 and, and 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God on the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yet we are speaking of the wisdom among those who are mature. Wisdom, however, not of this age, uh, nor of the rulers of this age, which are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Could we get to that place? Verse 7, is that where we are? Yeah. Or is that verse 8 now? To our glory, verse 7, maybe. Thank you. Think about that. Let's read this together. At least read, read it in your own heart. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. See, God wants, God wants his glory to be shed in us. And this becomes our glory shared with him. And this is wisdom from on high. <clears throat> the wisdom which none of the rulers of the age has understood. For if they understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as is written, things which eye has not seen nor ear has heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him, we can't get there naturally, but to those God revealed them through the Spirit, but we can get there spiritually. Could we say amen, church? This is how it has to be for us. 
that we understand that God deals with you and me first spiritually. If we run after knowledge first, we're missing it. It doesn't mean that we discount our brain. No, we have the mind of Christ, but we first must seek God spiritually. Could we get an amen, church? For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. This is godly wisdom. (laughs) This is what the world cannot have. And what is God is saying is rest in this. Rest in the fact that I will supply you all that you need spiritually. But, but determine in your mind to know nothing, at least first, except Christ and Him crucified. Where do you want your faith to rest? What the world's report is or what God says? Where? And He's given you a clear formula how to go about this. A clear pathway. A clear uh, means. So, you know how, where this goes. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Here we go again. And that's why people mock, because they cannot understand. But don't worry about it. They cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who has spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of God that he will instruct him but... We have the mind of Christ, praise God. The mind of Christ is in our spirit. We have the ability to know the thoughts of God, the revelation of God, the direction of God, the motive of God, the understanding of God. We are so blessed if we will determine, determine, determine to know nothing except Jesus Christ, to go after him spiritually, spiritually, spiritually. And I tell you what, God has been beating my drum, my drum, my drum about the way the church is presently founded, seeking knowledge, seeking understanding, seeking everything else except what he really wants for us. So, I mean, I'm beating you up a little bit, but I don't think God wants to beat you up. But, so I better not do that either. Let me just say this to you. The greater the extent of man's wisdom, human wisdom, the greater the power of the gospel and the greater the extent of the glory that goes to God. <laughs> As men become more and more and more and more uh, hesitant, resistant against the gospel, the manifestation of the power of the Spirit will grow more and more and more and more and more and more and be irrefutable. This is the promise of God, where it cannot be stopped. So we need to, in our church, in our lives, look after this, seek after this, be expectant after this. And let me say, you as your pastor have not really been all that attentive to this. And I'm not giving you a great big um, confession here. But as God is dealing with me in this season, this past two months, this and every other church must go in this direction. All of the fullness of the Spirit in every dimension. We must hunger and thirst for this. We must ask God for this. We must say, God, we want, don't want to know anything else. We do not want to know anything else except that which you're going to give us by the Spirit, and to believe that you want to manifest, 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 and not be embarrassed by it. Not be frustrated by it, not worry about, oh, oh, you want to sing blood songs? Oh, how tawdry, how terrible you want to do all of that. Then you become embarrassed, right? By some phony world standard. Did Christ die for us? He deserves all of who we are. He deserves every thought, every allegiance, every, everything we are, He deserves. He's worthy. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of all of our stuff. He's worthy, this Jesus. So, we we'll run out of paper, so that's probably... Um, it says in Proverbs 2, in uh, 15, this is just a sort of reflection of the wonder and goodness of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice. And he preserves the way of his godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart 
and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion, listen now, discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of evil. God is able to do it spiritually, folks. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Everything else flows out of that. Seek him first. Seek his face first. Seek all that he has for you spiritually first. Not finding out about him, finding him. I don't know you've heard this many times, many ways. To deliver you from the way of evil, from men who speak perverse things, from those who uh, leave the path of the uh, upright, to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil and rejoice in perversity of evil. Those paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. This is where the world is. This is where the world is. But God is going to give you wisdom and understanding if you'll seek him first to avoid all of these things. And he'll make your life still work no matter what. Still bring him glory and praise. So I'm going to pray with you. <laughs> I tell you what, if you can receive this, God has given you a foundation for your faith this morning. He really has. He's spoken to you that you are able to realize that all the stuff swirling around you is not a mystery to God. In fact, it's his plan. So don't look to the political thing to solve everything. No, I mean, you have to participate, but that is not your warrant. Your faith cannot rest on that stuff. So we're going to pray. <clears throat> so, Father in heaven... There may be one or two here today, God, that need to come to a place of the confrontation they have with your love and to realize, God, that, that you love them eternally. And your love and your mercy and your grace is greater than anything they've ever thought, anything they've ever done, everything they've ever contemplated, everything they've ever understood or didn't understand. And that you've died, oh God. You've died and shed your blood to redeem them, dear God, to forgive or re-forgive. And the word of God says, if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, if you just give your life to him, if you'll say, I'm no longer my own, and confess he's your Lord, as to say, he's in charge from here on in, and believe in your heart that he was raised on the third day, meaning that he is indeed the Son of God, able to do all of this. If you'll do those things, ask him to forgive you, wash you clean from your sins, but come in so you have his spirit that we talked about today. And he'll come in. He'll come in and redeem you, and you and he will be one, and you will be in him, and he will be in you. Ask him to do that today if you've never done it. And if you've done it in the past somewhere, but you haven't been walking with him, ask him for renewal. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him to receive you in you, and he'll do that. And I, while we're praying, I just would ask if anyone is in any of those circumstances where they would say, yes, that applies to me, and would just... Show me your hand. Show God your hand if there's anyone who says, yes, Lord. Well, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, we just love you today. You've seen those, God, who bear witness. You've seen the ones, dear God, that say yes to you. So, God, what we ask you now, Lord God, is to seal this word, Father. We ask you, dear God, that we would have heard you with our whole heart. We would not worry about what the enemy is up to, the lies and the schemes what the world is saying, what the news is saying, what the culture is saying, what all those ugly shows are doing, dear God, the chaos we see on the streets, the brutality, the, the, the violence, and, and the, the, the dishonoring of human life and human worth, all those things we see, dear God, we will not be governed. We determine, God, to know you. We determine to know you, Jesus, and you, we determine, that is our heart, God, Lord, have that burn in us, that this is your plan for us to know you to the uttermost, O oh God. So bless us in that today, dear God, that our faith would rest in you, the power of God, 
the manifestation of your spirit. Bless your people. I pray this, God, that we would leave here rejoicing, God, that you are the foundation for our faith. We pray it in Jesus' name.